The Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 798 for Monday, January 20th, 2020. Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where we take all your questions, your cool stuff found, your tips, everything. We mash it all together, usually boil it a little so that an agenda percolates to the top. And the agenda <laughs> serves the goal of every single one of us learning at least five new things. Now, sometimes those things are learned just by, you know, os the osmosis of inhaling the steam. And other times it's like very specific stuff. It's all good. It doesn't matter how you learn. We just like to learn and we like to have a little bit of fun doing it. Sponsors for this episode include a new sponsor, LegalZoom.com, where promo code MGG gets you some great savings on it's actually a great service to what they're doing there and the things they've added. Anyway, we'll talk more about that later. And also uh, Cashfly at Mac.Cashfly.com. You got to check it out. So we'll talk about all of those in a moment here. But for now, here happily in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in disappointingly snow and ice free Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. Yeah, we had about six inches of snow last night. Um, yeah, we got nothing. Huh. I'm, I'm very disappointed in winter. <laughs> okay. Some people might. Other than the ice, other than the cool ice storm we had a few, uh, about a month ago. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, they were saying we, we would, you know, be buried in snow and we haven't though. Maybe you have somewhat, it sounds like. So a little bit. Yeah. It was, it was really it, it, like super cold here for the last few days. Um, I mean, not, you know, not single digits Fahrenheit, but teens Fahrenheit. And uh, so when the snow came, it was still, it was, that. it's weird here. There, there's a phrase that goes around here, uh, too cold to snow. And, and there's some truth to that. You know, usually the snow comes because a front is moving through and that front is often a warm front that is, you know, causing that to happen. This was a weird snowstorm in that uh, I think it was a warm front because it was like 40 Fahrenheit today. But uh, when the snow was coming through last night, it was, you know, 13, 14, 15 degrees Fahrenheit. And. And that's that's it. That's colder than it generally is when it snows here. It's usually in the 20s, you know, high 20s. So it was this very fluffy, icy uh, snow just coming down from. So it was pretty, you know, and it was it was that. Oh, OK. And then we've muffled, gotten what I've that never muffled really. Muffled silence mm. when the snow comes down, you know, where it's just like. Oh, that's yeah, always peaceful. fun. But yeah, we've been nice. getting what they call snow squalls, which I guess is like. Mm hmm. Very short bursts of intense, like blinding snow and and winds and stuff like that, and it's like we we evidently out. had those daily here while while you and I were at CES. My family told me that they were having those. All right, but but I haven't seen any of those this year. But yeah, those can be a little little crazy. I I I prefer like snow that's like you know it's going to come down. There's going to be something on the ground. Like you said, you get that muffled silence. Anyway, let's talk about right. cool stuff found, shall we? We'll start with listener Larry, who says that uh, way back in 792, there was a mention of a parallel screenshot tool. This sounds similar to Capto, C-A-P-T-O, which has options such as opening the current browser URL in the Capto browser for capture. And he says it has a benefit that it's also part of Setapp. So if you've got that, you've already got a license for Capto. But Capto's from uh, from Global Delight, which makes actually lots of cool things. So uh, we'll put a link to that in the show notes, as always. But uh, but thanks, Larry. Good stuff, man. That's that's what we do here for the cool stuff found. Thoughts on that, John? Or it's time to move on to Scott uh, with his with his first one. What's here. Scott got? Scott says, uh, he says, like most people, I am constantly wondering and worrying about how much battery life is left in my devices. Not only my iPhone and iPads, but also my wireless keyboard and wireless trackpad. Checking the remaining charge levels has been a nuisance until I found Batteries app from Fidel, F-A-D-E-L dot I-O. The app itself isn't really the fantastic part, but rather what it adds to the notification center on my Mac. Uh, and he sent through a screenshot that shows, sure enough, a listing of all of his devices and their respective batteries. It's a little widget in the notification center 
uh, that sees everything on your network that your Mac can see, which is pretty cool. He says setup took just a minute and now I can see the charge level and whether the device is plugged in for recharging just by opening the notification center. So that's super handy. If you ask me that I like um, it's uh, it, you can get a 14 day free trial from uh, from Fidel.io and then um, and then uh, I'm not sure what it costs to buy, but I'll, I'll tell you because I'm looking and it should in theory come up six bucks. OK, well, there you go. Not so bad. So very cool. Yeah, I got to I got to mess with this. That sounds super handy. Yeah, so I can know. No, that's like, awesome to uh, I was going to say introduce more anxiety into my life because now I'm going to know the status of all my batteries and whether they're dying or not. Yeah, but that's handy. Hand, like for me, <laughs> like sitting in my office, knowing is my did, did I put my iPad on charge at home? I know I want to take it with me, you know, when I leave later, like without having to right. put on shoes and walk across the snowy driveway, which now is like a layer of a half inch of ice with snow on top of it. So you don't know where the um, ice is and you can you, you fall and hurt yourself like I can avoid hurting myself with this app. That's right. Six. Months. No, it, it, it th- th- Though it reminds me of a conversation I had at CES with the Z-Wave guys in that it it concerned me that the vendor of a product can choose or not choose to expose a certain piece of data. And this is getting into smart home and Z-Wave and stuff like that. But um, the only thing it reminds me of is that the thermostats that I got when I was on the Wink Hub, Dave, uh, their app did not offer battery level of battery operated thermostats, whereas smart things does so there's a tip for you if you're looking for the ability to look at the battery level then smart things is probably for you because um, i added that i added a trigger the thing is i couldn't add that trigger because apparently the the wink driver just didn't see that data yeah so, right okay right. whatever huh. so um no so it's great that um yeah i mean this takes it like to the next level and that it can show you battery levels on like everything which is really cool yeah yeah i want to i want to start running it and see what see what it does yeah yeah for sure cool um if you have been listening to this podcast for a very long time you might remember that i am a fan of not just standing desks but adjustable desks um, when i'm in my office uh, i love to stand at my desk not all the time but mm, i would say 80 percent of the time And so uh, I've had an adjustable desk down there for 10 years. And when we started this podcast, actually, John, that was my introduction to the idea of standing, because when we started this show, I stood for most of our first, I'll say, probably 30 episodes. Then when I when we moved everything up to the studio here, uh, I the way the ceilings are and stuff in here, I it just didn't make sense. So I sit. But. I've remained very interested in standing desks. Like I said, I have one in my office and I like a desk that's adjustable. And I recently had the opportunity to, to build and check out a standing adjustable standing desk from a company called autonomous at autonomous.ai. And of course I'll put a link in the show notes. Their standing desks are very cool, pretty easy to put together, you know, and really solidly built and the motors slash hydraulics in this, because they are adjustable are fantastic they move quickly they move in sync with each other they stay rock solid it's not like you know if when it the sound this will sound obvious when i say it but when you have a standing desk that is adjustable you're going to have all your stuff on it your computers your whatever you know your your glass of water your mug of tea or coffee or whatever you like to have right and so it needs to move smoothly and not be too herky-jerky because otherwise things don't stay where they are and this one moves really, really smoothly. And John, it's got a control pad that has four presets on it, kind of like you'd have in like the old days with your car radio where, you know, you you get it to where you want and then you set it so that you don't have to guess every time you're moving your desk up and down. You can have four presets so you could have one for when I'm sitting, one for when I'm standing, one for when if let's say you share the desk with somebody, you could have, you know, other things for other people and you just get it right to where you want. You hit the button and it goes there and uh, and it works out great. So uh, these are these are really nice, affordably priced, like four hundred twenty nine bucks for uh, for, a, a you know, a home office smart desk with all the all the bells and whistles there. That's that's pretty good. It seems like they sell chairs and stuff too here at Autonomous, and they look like 
you know, the, the Herman Miller style chairs, but they seem to be about half the price. So I might want to check one of those out too, but, um, but yeah, check them out. Autonomous standing desks. Good stuff. Cool stuff found. That's what we do. Uh, and then, you know, at CES, John, you mentioned CES, uh, which was, it's always a great place to go and see things. You know, we've here been looking a lot at SSDs that we can attach to our Macs for a variety of reasons. The biggest one, you know, it was weird. It was what, maybe six or eight months ago where we all started to realize that our clones that we were making uh, to our, uh, you know, our external drives were really slow to boot from. And that's because starting with Mojave, those clones like the, that operating system really isn't built to be run from just a rotational drive. It's either built to be run from an SSD or at least a, a fusion drive, which which has a lot of that stuff, you know, kept on the SSD. Uh, Mojave and de uh, definitely Catalina do not boot well or do not boot quickly. They will boot. They will successfully. Sure, but not quickly from a rotational drive. And so it was like six or eight months ago. It was like, all right, wait, wait a minute. We got to start paying attention to uh, what we clone these things to. Thankfully, SSDs have come down in price and all that good stuff. So you can start getting those. And, and depending on what you want to do with them, you can get them, you know, at a variety of different price levels at CES. I got to see the pluggable uh, Thunderbolt three SSD. It's got a cable built into it. And, uh, just this week, I got one here. I got a one terabyte version here, which I think on their website, website, wait, easy for me to say sells for four nineteen. I think you might be able to find it a little bit less expensive on like Newegg or Amazon, but, um, this thing is fast, right? Because it uses the Thunderbolt three bus. So you, you're not stuck with SATA or anything. It is an NVMe drive, John, and, you know, their their product packaging says that it'll do 2,400 megabytes per second reads and 1,800 megabyte per second writes. Uh, in my quick tests, I got like 22 megabyte, 2,200 megabyte reads and like 1,700 megabyte writes. So like their numbers are real. These are these are not, you know, theoretical. They are absolutely what I got just plugging it into my MacBook Air. I didn't even test it on the iMac in the office, which which may be, you know, because it's got, you know, way more CPU power might mm. a little bit better or whatever. But what I like is that they're quoting their throughputs in megabytes. Now, as some of you may recall, in the past, especially with rotational drives, mm. they would state their throughputs in megabits per second, which makes it look like it's maybe faster, which it really isn't. Yeah. So, yeah, no, no, no. So it's nice to see that transition yeah, uh, this happening is, with these wicked fast drives. <laughs> yeah. And this is faster than the internal drive in my uh, in my air. I think the internal drive in my air does about just about a thousand megabyte per second writes and I think maybe 1500 megabyte per second reads. So it's cool to be able to plug in a, you know, an SSD and see it go even faster, which, which is great and super portable. Like I said, it's got a cable built into it. So, you know, good, you're good to go. It makes it easy and it comes with a little nice little pouch and all that stuff too. So it's good. It's good. Uh, you want to take us to Lewis, John, tell us what Lewis found with the, uh, or is it Louis? Yeah. Sure. Oh, I don't know. It could be either. I'm I'm not. Yeah, I think he's in Canada. So yeah. Could no, be. that that's that is Louis. You are correct. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Okay. So here's what he's got. Um, this is good in the age of Catalina here. But Louis says, "Hey guys, I'm looking for a good replacement for ScanSnap Manager, which no longer works in Catalina. That's the software that Fujitsu makes for their ScanSnap series of." kind of proprietary scanners. Um, I know you guys discussed it in one previous show, but I'm having trouble finding it. I've tried view scan, but it doesn't work well. As soon as I activate duplex feeder, the document gets mangled in different sizes and the OCR seems to no longer work. And it's, it's just terrible. Uh, and he has a Fujitsu scan snap S 1500. So here's the party line on this deal because I had to go through this and fortunately it worked for me, but it may not for Fujitsu released something called so ScanSnap manager was their 32 bit suite of software. And they let people know via various means they're like, Hey, this isn't going to work under Catalina and we don't have any intent of updating it. 
to 64 bit, which they could if they wanted to, but they decided instead to release something called Scan Snap Home. Now, what's nice is that at least, so they list some very specific model numbers and they don't list the S1500 as a supported device, but they do list the IX1500. So my thought was that it's close enough. Unfortunately, he got back to us and said, no, it's not. (laughs) Now, the thing is, in my case, I had an 1100 series that didn't have an exact match, but their new software seemed to work for that. So... It's a roll of the dice. It is but worth trying, something. though, to, to your point, right? Like that that's definitely worth. I mean, I, I don't understand why it was being on his side so picky because, I mean, it's the same numbers, right? Right. I mean, right. Uh, how much of a difference is there? I mean, they gave it the same number as another product because you would think it has most of the features. But, hey, that's their decision. It's just how it goes. Yeah. But um, what am I saying, though? What I'm saying is that he did find. um. Another piece of software. So this is kind of a troubleshooting thing and a cool stuff found. So the cool stuff found is that he found a piece of software called Exact Scan. Cool. And I guess that's really about it. It, it appears to, uh, in, in it would sound like in his uh, appraisal, it does everything and more that, that he needs to do with the scanner. I mean, like in my case, I mean, it scanned a page. So I'm like, okay, I'm happy. But um, this software offers a bunch of other things that the uh, Fujitsu software does offer as well. If it's supported, uh, I see OCR. It does OCR. He said it was having problems with that. It, it supports it's a, a ton of formats, Apple script. Um, so if you want to kick your uh, scanning game, and you know we got this recommendation, but if you want to kick up your scanning game, this looks like, uh, some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, for sure. Now, how much is it, though? Let's see. Download. Buy. All right. Let's see if it's worth it, folks. 80 uh, bucks. Uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, the, the, for for good scanner software that does, you know, things other than scanning, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah. And they have an enterprise version and stuff like that. So uh, thank you for letting us know about exact scans. Yeah, I think the reality is you need to kind of if you've got an older scanner and you're trying to make it work, uh, you need to try all of these, you know, exact scan, view scan. And then if it's an old Fujitsu scanner, certainly scan snap home. But um, I have not tried exact scan with my um, with my old printer, but I, I, I don't even know. I don't know why I didn't even think of it as this as we were prepping this question but maybe maybe this will work for me john so yeah and yeah. um and you know we're, we're getting we had some other emails in our in our queue about people that um had problems with their printer like one person we were still trying to figure out what's going on here had a brother printer that all of a sudden didn't work under catalina one reason is that their control software just like in this case uh was not compatible <laughs> it was 32 bit and then they didn't want to update it so. sure yeah right so right. i mean we'll still see these problems um the one i saw something from you the other day dave in, in in an exchange with somebody and it's like do you think i should upgrade to catalina and i other than situations like this i would say for the most part the answer is probably now yes <laughs> yeah, so we'll take a little detour here. I, I, yeah, it, we've got a couple more cool things found to to go or cool stuffs found to go through for sticking with the uh, the branded message. But yeah, I I think you know I, I said it a few episodes ago that now with ten dot fifteen dot two and later if you're listening to this after ten dot fifteen dot three comes out, but with ten dot fifteen dot two, Catalina got to the point where. It, it's really stable. And I've now migrated lots of friends, family, can you know, clients, consulting clients and that sort of thing over to Catalina. And as long as we've been doing it, you know, with 10.15.2 is like the the first build of Catalina that they're seeing. Everybody's been, you know, I do the upgrade, kind of make sure it works or they make sure it works. And I, you know, I don't hear from them right away. A couple of days later, I'll be like, hey, um, your computer's still OK, like everything good or are you secretly like hating me? And, and they're like, no, 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 it's, it's, it's fine. I don't, you know, most of the time it's there. The answer is, yeah, I don't really notice anything different. It's fine. You know, it's like, okay, great, good, perfect. That's, that's the best way to go. And then, then I can sit down with somebody if they're interested 
and go through some of the, the you know, new capabilities that you might have because of Catalina in, in their, you know, specific word case or whatever. But yeah, no, it, it's been good. I, I do, though, make sure that I do a backup and, and this would be my advice for everybody do a backup. And if you can make a clone before you do it so that if you do, you know, migrate over and suddenly realize, oh, like crap, my scanner doesn't work or my printer doesn't work. And that is a very important part of your workflow. Then you just roll back and, you know, go back to the, the Mojave and then, you know, kind of retrench and figure out what the best path forward is with a little more information and knowledge. So, yeah, no, I, I, I think so. I think it's good. I'm, it's working. It's working well for us, which, you know, I mean, I shouldn't say that while I'm recording a podcast live and all that. But yeah, why not? Sure. It's been good. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, back to cool stuff found. Shall we, John? Sure. All right, cool. Scott has, um, an interesting thing. He says, uh, listening to episode 797, it became clear that, uh, you, Dave are as much of a geek about travel as me. He says, I don't fly as much as I used to, but still hit the road and the skies occasionally. Uh, he says, as a sidebar like you, I use TripIt too, TripIt Pro as well, and frankly, don't know how anyone who travels more than a few times per year could get along without it. Even even just once a year, traveling you know, TripIt Pro makes life so much easier. So I'm with you, Scott. Anyway, back to the cool stuff found. He says, I often wonder where other people are going when I see planes flying above me. Are they headed any place? Interesting. What's their altitude? Their destination? Now, he says, I can find out with a simple Siri command. He says, just ask Siri what's flying overhead. And it displays the amazing Wolfram Alpha search results showing you all the nearby flights in a handy table. Plus, most of the time, not it won't show this every time, but most of the time it also shows a sky map uh, that shows where they are relative to you on the globe. He says, it's a great use of combined GPS positioning and search technology and is there or literally the asking with Siri, try it. Ask Siri what's flying overhead. And uh, as Scott says, but I agree, you'll be delighted with the result. Yeah. Very cool stuff. I, I, I immediately did that. Of course, as soon as I saw Scott's email, I was like, Oh, that's so cool. Um, it's fun. It's fun. I know there's an app out there that you can like point at the sky and it'll, it'll show you the, um, the, 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 whatchamacallit, you know, the, the planes that are overhead or whatever. I used to, we did that several years ago. The first Mac stock, I remember Pilot Pete was, uh, he almost made it today too, but it didn't work. Uh, Pilot Pete was flying in to Chicago and then going to come to, he didn't make it to the Mac stock conference part, but he made it to Barry's party afterwards. And, um, which might be the last time the three of us were in a room together. Now that I think about it anyway. Hmm. And I remember, you know, knowing what time his flight was supposed to land and, and he was flying it. Right. I mean, he wasn't just, he was, he was piloting this thing because that's what he does. And, uh, and I remember being able to like, look up with my phone and see, it. I forget what app that was. I got to find that out. That was, that was yet another cool app. So yeah, fun. It's always good. Uh, Anchor is one of my favorite companies because they make, reliable, solid, fun, useful, interesting stuff at great prices. They are coming out with, it will begin shipping like this week, uh, an iPhone LED flash and it's 50 bucks. And I got a chance to, to test one of these, John. It's so cool. It, if you have an iPhone 11, it will, it, it will work ish with pre iPhone 11s. Uh, but if you have an iPhone 11, uh, you plug, you can, you can plug this in via lightning. It has its own battery in, in it. And when you take a picture it, and it decides that the flash should be engaged, it uses this flash in sync with the camera, sets it the way it needs to set it. And they say that because it's, you know, do only flashing the flash when it needs to, you can get like 10,000 photos on a single charge, or you can just press a button and it becomes a flashlight, Right. Uh, very, very cool. It's, it's synced with, with your cameras in a way. Like I walked into my living room the other night when it was pitch black in there. Like I could not see anything. And I took a picture 
And of course, I could see everything in the picture, but it, it was lit well. It didn't look artificial. The only thing that looked artificial to me was that my TV screen was pure black. And I realized when I have lights on in that room, just the way the lights are positioned, I see them reflecting off the glass of the TV screen. Whereas the way I had this, this flash positioned, it was not reflecting off the glass of the TV screen. So that was the only part that, that just to me was like, wait, this looks fake, but I know it wasn't because I literally just took the picture, but it was because of that. Cause I'm, you know, not used to seeing the room lit that way. So yeah, very cool thing. It's got a little tripod mount on it and stuff. So definitely worth Checking out, especially if you're someone that like if you like to do like a lot of portraits and stuff where it's good to have, you know, a light source that's a little bit uh, off center from your camera so that you can get some better depth and, and all that stuff. This could be a very, very cool thing. So, um, yeah, that's why that's why that's why it's in the list of cool stuff. found. <laughs> Pretty neat, huh, John? Yeah. And uh, hey, if you want to uh, track planes uh, while you were pontificating, um, I actually found something here. OK. So, uh, search for plane finder, plane finder. That's it. Okay. That sounds like the, app. and they have a light version and a pro version and the light version. I just ran it. And, uh, we, we do have, it showed me like four flights here. We, uh, we actually have some regional airports here. Yeah. And it looks like that's what it was showing me. The, the thing is the first screen that came up, it showed like the entire country and there was probably like, <laughs> 10,000 little plane icons. I'm like, okay, let's focus this let's a bit. Narrow this but I put in my zip code and everything's oh, great. Okay. So, um, huh. So cool. give but that do they, a, wait, give do, that they a have, people. do they have an app? Is this the, is this the app that I used or is this just plane finder? Um, dot com or, or dot net. What right? I told you about is, is an app called plane finder. An so. app. Oh, okay. All right, cool. Okay. It does it use like augmented reality where you can aim it at the sky. That's the app that I was using. No, was like no, I, I know what you're talking about. Literally highlighting the planes like on the screen. So, okay. All right. Well, we'll find we'll yeah, keep this. Looking. I think. Yeah, no, that'd be cool to see. Yeah. yeah. You know, Pete, Pete would probably know, but, um, but this one apparently, you know, sucks some um, FAA data, right. You know, about, cause like it showed me one. It's like, yeah, it's going from JFK to Hong Kong. And it's like, oh, okay, no, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Uh, I see a little plane flying over you right now, John. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're constantly, you know, N three one zero seven five is going one hundred and fifty knots. My enemies are constantly trying to determine my exact location, but I'm trying I, I to think. Try it's to an, stay a step ahead of them. It's an A thirty. It's a private plane. It's an A thirty six. I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know what that yeah. is, but uh, it's it, it's at forty two hundred feet. And uh, yeah, oh, that's that guy. Yeah, he he's always bugging me. You know. <laughs> that's awesome. All right, so we should probably do a show instead of me just obsessing about these planes. They move on the map. Gosh, how can you not pay attention to this? All right, squirrel. Mm -hmm. uh, feedback at macgeekup dot com. If you know of the app that I'm tr desperately trying to remember, and you don't mind telling me about something that's probably going to distract me from work, uh, feedback at macgeekup dot com is the place to send that to. And remember, folks, he said feedback at com. You know, I am always looking for something that sounds good, especially when I travel and am out and about and all that stuff. And I've also been a fan of audio engines speakers for a very, very long time. They they were I was introduced to them. Actually, I was introduced to them at one of our early Cirque du Mac parties. The, the uh, Dave and I think it was just Dave from audio engine. I don't think Brady was with them. came to dinner at, at one like one of our Cirque, early Cirque du Mac dinners, like the band dinner or something. Brian brought him over. It's like, wait, you're not supposed to bring anybody that, that's not in the band. Like and then it was like, oh, these guys are cool. OK, great. No problem. And uh and it's been a, a, a friendship ever since they were sp sponsors of the show for uh, a while in the early days too. They have a new portable Bluetooth speaker that they call the 512 portable Bluetooth speaker. I have to assume they named it that because 512 is the area code that is uh, throughout Austin, Texas, where they are uh, based and founded. But maybe that's not the reason, but it probably is uh, this speaker. You know, it's it, it's. I, 
for lack of a better term, I would call it one of these pill space shaped and sized speakers. It it's like the size of a t-shirt when rolled up. And the reason I say that is because that's about the size of the space that it would take in my suitcase. And I almost always forego one t-shirt in my suitcase so that I can have a speaker like this with me in my hotel rooms. Uh, and right. Well, your favorite's the JBL, if I recall. Well, I like I brought or with one me, of the ones that you usually take because it has pretty colors and, you know, it sounds good. and all that I, stuff. Yeah, I had brought with me to CES the JBL Pulse. I had to bring a big suitcase to, to CES. So I brought the JBL Pulse 4 with me so that we'd have, you know, kind of like a lava lamp thing in our in our living room there in our in our suite there at the Mirage. So it just kind of looked cool. But um, but this in terms of sound quality, this one is freaking amazing it's um it's not inexpensive it's 169 bucks so you know certainly more than the 100 bucks or so that you would spend on uh perhaps some of these other pill speakers not the not the pulse that you mentioned but you know some other ones but um it's got two um two tweeters two speakers in it if you will and then a bass resonator and i'm looking at the size of these speakers so it's two two inch woofers and then one three inch by one and three quarter inch passive radiator on the back. But these two woofers are separated out such that when you lay this thing on its side, which is how you're supposed to play it, you really get stereo sound. Like I was able, you know, I always use Pink Floyd's money as my quick test of how well the stereo separation mm -hmm. is. Well, it's just, you know, it's it's easy, right? It was recorded in quadraphonic sound, but but it, it works in stereo. Yeah. Well, that song has unusual separation of channels. <laughs> Correct. And it's right out of the gate. So you can really test it well. And even at like 10 feet away from this speaker in my kitchen, uh, I, I heard very clear stereo separation with this and the sound. And in addition to that, the sound was quite good. So, you know, to get something in a size like this that offers, you know, stereo separation at that kind of distance, 169 bucks makes all the sense in the world. Uh, it's, of course, battery powered Bluetooth. I think it's got like 12 hours of battery. And um, and it also has a an aux input, the the little, you know, three and a half inch millimeter or, or yeah, stereo mini jack thing that we're used to calling the aux port. And it's got, um, yeah, you know, like a USB port to charge it and all that stuff. So definitely worth checking out the audio engine 512 portable speaker. I put it on the uh, on, in the show notes because that's what we do. One last cool stuff found, John, from listener Rob, is uh, an app called Sensei at sensei.app, S-E-N-S-E-I dot app. And it is a, a Mac cleaner style app, right? And there's a variety of these. There's some that are great, some that aren't so great. This is uh, based on my experience with it this week. This is definitely one in the former category, the great category. And it shows you, it's got like a nice little dashboard that, that shows you what's going on with your Mac in real time, how much space you're using, how much your CPU is in use, RAM, that sort of thing. Uh, all, you know, about your graphics cards and all that good stuff. And then it's got, it's some sort of, uh, y you know, utilities that you would use, like an optimizer, an uninstaller, uh, all of that. One of the things that I found that was really handy is you can see what launch agents are being run on your Mac and you can turn them on and off in a very simple interface. I always mention Lingon anytime we talk about managing launch agents. Certainly you can do it from the terminal, but it's sort of a pain in the in the neck and it's hard to get the, just a, a visual list of what's actually active versus what could be active. and. Uh, and this makes it even easier than Lingon to see. It's certainly much simpler, especially if all you're wanting to do is turn things on or off. If you don't need to like mess with their settings or anything, it was just like, yeah, I don't want that anymore. Just turn it off. You can do that. So yeah, you really, it, it, this one's worth checking out. They've got a, a free trial and then um, I'm not sure what it costs. I think it's uh, it's 29 bucks for a, a one year license. And then if you want a, uh, just a purchase you can do that for 59 bucks so we're checking out sensei.app s-e-n-s-e-i.app so thanks for sending that in rob very very cool stuff i'd never heard of that before so that's what that's what we like to do you know what i mean john it's good yeah i like them so i've never heard of them before but they they uh show how they compare to some 
other competing products and they're in Sweden. So how could mm. you not trust them? Uh, sure. I guess <laughs> I, my, my, the Swedish friends that I have are all people I trust uh, pretty much implicitly. So, you know, that maybe that, I don't know what that says, but it might say something about them or me or both or who knows. All right. Uh, I want to take a minute and talk about our first sponsor, which is our newest sponsor, which is LegalZoom. Uh, you know, so here's the thing. With LegalZoom, you can do all kinds of different stuff. They make it super easy to fill out all the forms that you might need for a variety of things. You know, if you're starting a business or doing anything like that, obviously they've got it all. You can do your formation papers and all of that and just make sure they make sure it's it's right, you know, because they're they're giving you these forms that are vetted and written and all that stuff. Uh, if you're not starting a business, though. I, I will plead with you, as I have been with all of my friends recently, uh, had some stuff going on that I haven't really talked about on the show here, but I will say this, if you don't already have a will or a healthcare proxy or anything like that, please, please get that done and LegalZoom can make it super easy. And you do that for yourself, but really when you do it for yourself, you're doing it for all of your family uh, that might need to be the ones that help you when you can't be helped. And similarly, encourage your families to do this so that you uh, can help them when they need to be helped and you are not stuck having to go to like, you know, probate court and all that stuff. This is really important and LegalZoom can help. In fact, over the past 19 years, LegalZoom has helped more than 4 million people because they provide the resources that you need to confidently resolve your personal and your business legal needs. Now, what's cool is they have a network of attorneys that you can turn to for uh, questions and things like that. And they've got like an annual payment plan to do with this. And it's, it, it depends on what state you're in, but I checked a couple of different states and it's, you know, somewhere between 350 and 400 bucks and in, in, for an annual thing, you can talk to an attorney about some sort of preliminary stuff. Anytime you have an issue, uh, obviously there's, there's limitations and stuff, but because legal zoom isn't a law firm you can count on their network of independent attorneys for advice at the right price, since they don't charge by the hour. This is fantastic. So make 2020 a year that you'll remember for the right reasons and use LegalZoom to help you out. And here's the thing. Go to LegalZoom.com today and then make sure you enter the promo code MGG in the box at checkout for special additional savings. That's LegalZoom.com promo code MGG LegalZoom where life meets legal. And that's a good thing. It really is. So Thanks to LegalZoom for doing what they do. Please, just if you don't do anything else, just go to LegalZoom.com and use them to get your will and, you know, your your healthcare proxy and, you know, your living will and, and all of that good stuff in place so that people, so that you can be taken care of if something happens. Please, just do that for me if you would. LegalZoom.com, promo code MGG, our thanks to LegalZoom for sponsoring this episode. All right, man. Um... In show 797, we were talking about notes and searching by keyboard. And I dug a little bit more into this, and so did listener Jeff, who says, um, without opening the note, he says that command option F will search that note. Um, I looked into this, as I said, and in notes, I found that command option F is for me anyway, on my computer is the shortcut to search all of my notes, but command F just regular old command F searches inside the selected note. So this is super handy to be able to just kind of find things. It seemed very intuitive as I was going through it. So hopefully those of you that are having any problems searching in notes, check this out, just go to the, you know, launch notes and go to the, uh, edit menu and look at the find list. Are you eating breakfast or something, John? I'm hearing a lot of like, Oh, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Everything. All right. You're hungry. Like, can we get you some food? No, <laughs> it no. Sounds I'm, like you've already I'm, got some. Okay. Working on it. Okay. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> You're in good company. My friend, we interviewed a couple of years ago. We interviewed, uh, Kenny Aronoff, uh, the, the world renowned drummer. You've, you've all seen him 
play with a variety of people. He plays with everybody. I think he's playing with Fogarty and I think Bob Seger these days, but uh, bald guy wears sunglasses and you've seen him at like shows or whatever. We had him on uh, another, ep- another show that I do called gig gab for, for working musicians. Great guy, really energetic. Like he's like more energetic than me, which is saying a lot and way more energetic than me. And like halfway through the show, I hear exactly that. Like, you know, and I'm like, Kenny, you know, like, do you need to stop? He's like, no, 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 no. You know, I got to go into the studio after I do this interview, but I didn't want to stop. And my wife brought me some eggs. So I'm just eating them while we do the show. I'm like, well, Kenny, there you go. So, uh, yeah, well, maybe I'll have to get something less crunchy. This is a, uh, uh, crunchy granola. Yeah, don't eat while we record the show. It's just like, like you know, I mean, what, what do you need, 90 minutes of, of not, like, you know, snarfing down? So maybe just, like, save it for afterwards and, and, and savor it afterwards. Save it for afterwards. Yeah. Savor it afterwards. There you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, but hopefully that helps you folks with notes. So, yeah. Uh, and I put a link to that gig gab with Kenny Aronoff. If you're, if you're into music, it's certainly if you're a drummer, but, but he really just had some great lessons. Frankly... If you are anyone that is super busy and wants to hear how someone else who is super busy manages their schedule, he doesn't like to say no to anybody, but he obviously realizes he can only be in one place at one time uh, and that like he's going all over the world. So um, it like he had some really good little tidbits and nuggets to share about managing your life and your schedule and all that. So anyway, uh, that's enough pitching of that. Bruce has something to share. Bruce. Oh, no, I don't want to put that away. OK, uh, Bruce says you guys recently talked about how to deal with the, you know, data volume in Catalina, because in Catalina, our our volume, if it's Macintosh hard drive, as it would be by default, once you're finished with the upgrade to Catalina, uh, you now have Macintosh hard drive and Macintosh hard drive dash data. So he says you recently talked about how to deal with the data volume in Catalina. But Howard Oakley at Eclectic Light Company, uh, Howard Oakley's article really spells it out. He says, I did not know that there was a delete APFS volume option right there in disk utility. Uh, You might want to dig a little bit more into this. And for sure, we'll link to this article that uh, Bruce sent along. But you're absolutely right that if you're doing a clean install in Catalina, and that's really what Howard's article is about here you will want to delete that data volume before you do the clean install. Of course, all of this, hopefully it goes without saying, but we say it anyway, make sure you do your backups before you do anything crazy like this. But, um, you know, then you, you, you delete the data volume, then the system volume, and then create the new volume and install Catalina. And in the process, it will fork these and create the things that you need to do. So, uh, very cool. And Howard talks through all of this in a little more de- in fact, a lot more detail, but, but it, not in a confusing way. He's, he's very good at, at spelling all this out. So, uh, so yeah, make sure if you are doing that clean install and you're trying to wipe a volume, I, I always, whenever I'm doing a clean install, I don't just erase the existing volume. I delete the volume and re add it or add a new one and name it the same perhaps. But um, but that way, I know that I'm starting with something fresh. And with this, you got to delete two volumes and you should do the data volume first and then the uh, the main one, which is the system. Uh, Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I've just instinctually done that just because that sounds like the right thing to do is you don't want to delete one and not the other. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. Then you get this, you know, crazy mix of old and new and it's like it's not good for anybody. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. 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 All right. Good. So thank you for that, Bruce. Very, very cool. Um, Jed has a question and you know what? We'll just let you ask it here, Jed, if, uh, if our technology will agree with us. Hey guys, happy new year or well, time being what it is, is complicated because I'm leaving this message before new year's, but I bet you will not listen to it till after. So I hope your new year is good and nothing drastically crazy has happened in the last since you've checked this. Anyways, I have two questions for you, uh, both that have just been kind of picking at me, both hopefully more opinions than a tech answer. So question number one is, I am doing renovation in my house. 
uh, just moved six months ago. You guys gave me some good advice then. I have a question is, years ago you said there's no point to wiring electricity and not wiring Ethernet. With mesh, with Wi-Fi, with kind of the new technology, is it still worth it to do wired Ethernet throughout a house? It's not a big house. And more importantly, the only place I really need something to the fast, fast speed, I will be wired. So just curious of what your thoughts are. And then the second question, as I drag on, is I have a, a MacBook Pro 2018, I think. Um, it's Thunderbolt 3 and USB ports. I am debating, just for USB devices only, getting another hub. The question is, do you think a Thunderbolt hub is better than a USB hub in this case, just because of the way it spreads all the information? Like, to get a Thunderbolt hub for three or four USB devices, hard drives, do you think it's better to go Thunderbolt, or do you think it's better to go USB? Uh, better to go USB, meaning it is substantially cheaper to have a USB port hub than it is to have a Thunderbolt hub. Hope this makes sense. Love to hear you guys' thoughts. And like I said, Happy New Year. Hope you didn't get caught. <laughs> Thanks, Jed. Yeah, he sent that, I think, about three hours before at least our clock flipped over here. So, uh, uh, so yes, thank you. And so far, so good. Um Starting with mesh uh, versus wired Ethernet and all of that stuff, I, I think, yes, um, the cost to wire Ethernet, especially in the scenario, you know, where you have walls exposed still and, you know, or, or yeah, all of that uh, is super inexpensive at that moment. And it just paves the path for the future. I would definitely still do it. Um, mesh with Wi-Fi 5 doesn't do full gigabit or higher speeds. Plus, even with Wi-Fi 6, you know, you're still talking about wireless technology for your backhaul. Uh, so there's all these sort of questions about what is going to work, what's going to interfere. And, and those things are changing constantly in your home as you move things around, as people move around, as devices come in and out, you know, what is going to cause interference that matters and all of that. So you don't really know, but with Ethernet, you know, so I'd still do Ethernet. Uh, it, let me put it this way. At this moment, like at this moment in time, I am still now I haven't done this yet. I've, I've been thinking about it for five years. So bear that in mind, too. But I may still hire an electrician this year to run an Ethernet line essentially from one side of my house to the other. Uh, right now, I'm doing it with Mocha. In the past, I've done it with Powerline, which is much, much slower. Mocha is pretty fast, but Mocha gets weird and sometimes needs to be reset because it's weird. Mocha is run essentially running Ethernet over your coax cables inside your house alongside your coax signal, which is great that you can sort of do it all at the same time, but it gets a little wonky sometimes, at least in my house and I need to reset it and things are weird. And I would like to have ethernet straight to where the TV is in the house. So I may still do that even with Wi-Fi six as the backhaul for this. Cause I just like a reliable backhaul, not just amongst my Wi-Fi devices, but amongst my network as a whole. So, um, yeah, a year from now, after we've had a lot more sort of practical experience with Wi-Fi six, especially with mesh backhaul with Wi-Fi six, I, I might, you know, I, I might back off on this a little bit, but probably not. If the walls are open, I say put the Ethernet in and I, I think you should put two into every room, but maybe that's a little bit crazy. But once you're using one for Ethernet, you can't use the other for anything else. And those, you know, twisted pair can be used for a lot of different things. And you've got four of them per run so uh so you got a lot of different options so i don't know that's that's my that's my feeling is is it just creates options so i don't know well before and then we'll go on to the usb versus thunderbolt thing in a minute but john any thoughts the on only thing i would uh, so i'm looking right now dave and the thing is so you're starting to now see various machines including like the uh iMac Pro and stuff like that, offering 10 gigabit instead of gigabit Ethernet. Mm. The thing is, I'm looking here, Dave, and the pricing on those switches, if you want like a 24 port 
10 gigabit switch, it looks like they're in the neighborhood of like a thousand bucks. So to me, 10 gigabit is still probably a bit pricey for consumer grade stuff. So I would say that gigabit um, should serve the needs of most people. That that that's just me. I mean, I have a twenty four port gigabit switch. Um, you know, it only costs a few hundred bucks. Uh, TP Link, I think it is. But yeah. Um, if you want to be on the bleeding edge, you could get a ten gigabit infrastructure. Um, but I'm also seeing that a lot of these switches are like, oh, well, we'll give you four ten gig things for your 10 gig stuff. And then we'll give you, you know, uh, a bunch of the slower, but still pretty quick in the, in grand scheme of things, you know, compared to Wi-Fi. Right. Right. So, um, so I don't think we're yet at the point where, you know, a 10 gig switch is, is affordable for your backhaul, but, um, gigabit definitely is. Well, but that's um, it. So a couple of things about that. Number one, the cabling you have in your wall, if you're putting cat six in, you can run, uh, right. 10 gig ethernet over cat six cable. So that is like, you're fine. Cat seven or six a is, is better because, uh, cat six, it says will go 55 meters with 10 gig in ethernet and cat six a or cat seven will go a hundred meters with 10 gig ethernet, but, but still, so that cable you have in your wall could be used for either. So you don't need to make that decision at the time, but I would right. I would say, you know, definitely cat six if you're doing it today. Probably really though, cat seven, because why not? You know, I and I I don't have those prices in front of me as to whether it's significantly more expensive for a spool of seven versus six. Uh, but but that you know, it paves the the whole point of this is to pave the path for the future. As far as whether to use it for gig or 10 gig Ethernet, you know, like those switches like uh QNAP was showing off a smart switch at uh CES. That had and I'll 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 find the the switch and put it in the show notes. But it it had I think eight total ports, four of which were I'll call them combo ports. I mean they they had two ports, but you could use one or the other of each of these four ports, and it was either one gig Ethernet or ten gig Ethernet on four of these ports, and it was like five hundred bucks for a smart switch that had you know, quite a bit of 10 gig capability on it. And that's super helpful Mm. because, you know, with, um, you know, if you're using Wi-Fi six, that can theoretically go way faster than gigabit ethernet. And then you can start using things like, you know, if you maybe your Synology or your QNAP unit, of course, uh, uses 10 gig. So you plug that in 10 gig. And even if that's the only thing you have plugged in 10 gig, if it can go faster than gigabit, then, that's great, it, you know, because if you've got four client devices that are plugged in uh, gigabit and then you've got 10 gig from that same switch off to your Synology unit. Well, now each of those devices can pull it right. a gig and you're still getting like you don't necessarily need your all of your Macs on 10 gig to take advantage of 10 gig. If, you know, we've got four of us in the office, you know, you know, right. You know what I'm saying? So, oh, right. No, yeah. I think that's kind of what I said. Yeah. No, and it kind is of what you said. Yeah. So, you know, but put in the best cabling, you know, and the, this came from the chat room from Brian and others, but uh, mm. get the best cabling that you can. Um, even if you're not going to be using it at full capacity, you know, I mean, you know, the logic is, when you install it, you know, do it right the first time. Don't, right. You don't want to go back and install it again. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, NCSUCPE in our chat room at MacGeekCab.com slash stream looked up and says uh, for a thousand foot spool of uh, cat six a cable, which is which will go the same hundred meters as cat seven. It's uh, for a thousand foot spool. It's two sixty five, two hundred sixty five dollars. And for a thousand foot spool of cat seven. It is seven hundred dollars. So, you know, in the well, in again, in the grand scheme of things, if you're doing a big install, you know, I mean, you're talking, you're probably not going to put a thousand feet of Ethernet cable in your house. You may wind up having to buy the thousand foot spool if your electrician isn't just stocking this stuff. Although, if your electrician isn't, you might want a different electrician. So, you know, you're talking a couple of hundred bucks for your entire house to run. Cat 6A versus Cat 7, uh, you know, at that point, you're going to blow a couple hundred bucks on something you don't even think about 
at some point. So I'd put cat seven in, but six, a certainly for 10 gig ethernet would, would suffice. So, all right. Nice. Now, um, the, the question about Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt, easy for you to say versus USB C hubs. So it, it depends, right? A USB hub will still be running off the same USB bus that your Mac provides at least to it. Um, so depending on how much speed you need from those drives simultaneously, you might run into a bottleneck. It also depends on how they structure the, the, the hub itself because USB C is, you know, I mean, especially if you're plugging in something that's, that's doing, you know, like USB 3.0, one gen two. I can't ever remember what the terminology is because it changes every day. <laughs> um, but you, you know, depending on what, what your hard drives are doing and how fast they are, you might wind up having two separate, say USB a buses inside of a USB C hub. Not all USB C hubs are created equal. Uh, you know, the folks at other world computing will it, it correctly and appropriately tell you, you know, that, their hub has enough bandwidth in it for everything to operate at full speed. That is not the case with every hub that's out there. And so you want to be careful to make sure that the hub that you're getting is doing all of that right. Um, Thunderbolt docks. And really, we should be calling these docks, not hubs. So USB-C docks, Thunderbolt docks, add a USB bus to the system. So it's an additional bus. Uh, and sometimes two USB buses, again, for that reason of balancing bandwidth and making sure you have enough so that it can allow all your USB devices to operate at full speed all the time as well. But you're paying, a, a you know, what I'll call the Thunderbolt tax for that. Honestly, I think, in my opinion, the only reason to go with a Thunderbolt dock is if you especially for something portable uh, is if you're running multiple video streams. And of course, you can't do that. Uh, effectively with a USB C dock, you're better off doing that with Thunderbolt. But I think for what you're talking about here, you know, look at the speeds on the drives and then take a look at these USB C docks and make sure that they're engineered properly to manage that for you. And, and like you said, you can save a ton of money going with, you know, USB C docks for 30 to $50 versus Thunderbolt docks, which are, you know, start at 130 and go up to three or even 400, depending on, you know, how many ports you're getting and what you're doing with it and what, what, what other technology is in it. So, you know, I would, I, I certainly would look at like the other world computing USB-C docks because we know that they've engineered those right. They aren't the only ones that engineer them right. The, the pluggable folks uh, that I mentioned earlier, they've been making USB-C docks for quite some time and they, you know, I asked them at CES, they've got a new uh, dock out. Actually, I think I think the new dock is the Thunderbolt dock that they were showing at CES. I'm pulling this off the top of my head, so forgive me if I get it wrong. But but I was asking them, you know, how many USB buses have you put in here and how have you balanced it? And they're like, oh, right. Good question. You know, and they they, they seem to have an, uh, the right answer and in, in that they had engineered it, at least with the thought of making sure that people are, would be using this and really wanting good bandwidth out of it. So. Uh, so I would, you know, check out those folks. There, there are, there are several other vendors that are, that are good. Just ask the questions and make sure you get your, um, you know, your answers about how bandwidth is balanced and all that good stuff. So I, I think you can sort of start with USB C when choosing a dock for the purposes you described with just having some drives and that attached and only go to Thunderbolt if you can't find what you want slash need in a USB-C dock, but I think you will find what you need in a USB-C dock and save yourself a bunch of money. So thoughts on that, Mr. Braun? Mm, nope. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, you and I ran into something interesting at CES and I don't have the, I have not finished all of my testing with it. We did a bunch of testing at CES. I have not done this. I have not completed the sort of other side of this testing since we got back. But I had brought out that LaCie uh, rugged SSD Pro, and it might be the Pro rugged SSD. I'm, I'm getting the words in the wrong order. I brought that out to CES with me, A, because I like to have a, a clone drive with me in case something goes sideways with my laptop or whatever while I'm traveling. But I also wanted to bring it out to show to you because it, like the pluggable one we mentioned earlier, it goes really, really fast because it's an NVMe Thunderbolt 3 SSD, right? Cool. So... We're in the hotel. Show me. 
Right. Right. So you said, show me. Exactly. So we're in the hotel room one night and I plug the drive in and I do the testing and it's do it. I ran black magic speed test and it's doing USB three speeds, not anything faster than that. And I'm like, what? And I knew like I had tested this at home and it worked fine. I tested it on that same laptop at home, in fact, and on my iMac in the office. But I definitely tested it on the laptop. I'm like, what's going on? Like, wait a minute. So my MacBook Air has two USB-C ports that are both Thunderbolt 3 capable. Into one of them, I had a dock plugged in, a USB-C dock plugged in uh, for so that I could have some USB-A ports for like our microphones and stuff because we recorded a couple of episodes of Daily Observations there. But also, you know, to pass power through and, and various other things just so I'd have one cable at the little, you know, desk slash table that I was plugging it into at the at the hotel. I'm like, all right. So I ejected the dock and I plugged in the drive and then it went at Thunderbolt three speeds. And it even showed up like looking in system uh, profile or whatever we call it now. It, it would, it, at that point it showed up as a Thunderbolt device, but in the prior scenario, it showed up as a USB device. It's like, okay, why is this bouncing back and forth? Now I know this, this, uh, let see drive has the capability, not all Thunderbolt three SSDs do, but this one I know has the capability of connecting to a USB three only uh, device, not just, it doesn't have to just be Thunderbolt. I think the pluggable one I mentioned has to be Thunderbolt uh, earlier in the show, but you know, uh, we can look at the specs and check that. And so like, okay, this is weird. And uh, so then I tried another USB dock that I had with me because for whatever reason, I'm that nerd that carries at least two and exactly the same thing happened. Didn't matter which ports I used. If so, that what what we diagnosed while we were in Vegas, correct me if I'm wrong on this, John, was that if you plugged in a USB dock first, then plugging that drive and I need to test this with other drives this is really the test. But then plugging that drive in second caused that drive to come online as a USB device. But if I plugged in the drive first, it would come online as a Thunderbolt device and then I could plug in the USB hubs either one of them and it would they would attach as usb and work just fine the drive would remain attached as a thunderbolt device and work just fine and we left it that way for several hours and then tested after a couple hours and yes sure enough the speeds were all still it wasn't like you know something weird happened or whatever so i it, i feel like i and i had a long I had a long geeky conversation with larry o'connor at, at owc uh, I think it was the next day or something, John. And, and I told him about this. I'm like, have you seen this before? He's like, dude, that, it, you know, at first he was like, that doesn't really make sense. And he's like, well, wait a minute. You know, the Intel chip that's being used this way. I was like, okay, yeah, this guy knows a lot more about this stuff than me. Um, but, but he, he sort of reasoned out why it might be happening, but he couldn't figure out whether it, he couldn't it, just in his head. I didn't have any of the stuff with me for us to test. But uh, theoretically, he wasn't entirely certain whether the problem was in the chipset of the drive that we're testing with or in the chipset of the Mac. And he seemed to agree with us, John, that it's something in the Mac, but he wasn't. That was just his gut feeling. He's like, you should test it because it might be the drive that's for whatever reason. But I like the drive shouldn't know what's plugged into the other side of that bus. So I, I feel like right. it's got to be the Mac. Yeah. I'm going with the Mac firmware yeah. or driver or yeah. something in that it should always negotiate the fastest connection. Mm -hmm. Should. Correct. Is yes. it doing that? And from what you and I saw, no. the order in which you plug things in determines what the maximum yeah. connection speed is, which is, is crazy talk. It's crazy right? talk. Yeah, but it, I mean, it sort of makes sense, right? If the Mac has just decided, okay, we're going to call yeah. this bus a USB bus. And then when something new gets plugged in, it just says, hi, I'm a USB bus to it. And the drive's like, okay, uh, I guess that's what we'll use. And good. Sounds good. Like if the Mac doesn't say, hi, I'm Mr. Thunderbolt first, then the drive doesn't know to say, are you Mr. Thunderbolt? You know, yeah, I, mean? I just wonder if there's like a power condition or something yeah. where it's like, yeah. oh, well, I see this happening. So I better connect this way instead of that way. Right. It's like, uh, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you're okay. wrong, but <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. You're wrong, but, or I think you're wrong yeah. because you could do, you could do, you could do better Mac. 
But here's the thing. If I didn't, you know, I got when I got this drive, I tested it six different ways from Sunday. We talked about it on the show. Like in my mind, this drive was done. I, you know, like I now trust it. I know everything I need to know about it. And I moved on. And and I say this because I probably did more than 99% of the people who buy a drive like this would ever do. Right. But I proved that it was going fast enough because I, I need to do that before we talk about it on the show. If I had, there's no reason I would ever have speed tested this drive again, except that I was sitting next to you and I wanted to show you how fast it was going. Had you not been there I don't know how long it would have taken me to realize that this thing was connecting USB, not Thunderbolt in that scenario. And that's a pretty common scenario when I travel to have a USB dock connected pretty much full time if I'm at the desk and then just plug this in. So, you know, if I was deciding to let's say I'm at WWDC next year and, you know, I do the, the stupid thing that I always do, which is install the very first beta on my laptop of, you know, <laughs> 10.14 or whatever it's going to be or 10, sorry, 10.16. And uh, I would not know. And the first thing I want to do is clone my drive. Maybe I'll, maybe I'm not quite as stupid next year. And I, I clone it, you know, clone my internal drive to the external and then install on the external. And now I'm booting from the external and I'm booting over USB C or over USB, not over Thunderbolt. And I like how long would it take me to know that that was the thing? I'd probably blame any speed issues that I saw. And maybe there wouldn't be really anything practical, but uh, certainly backing up, I would notice, you know, that it was taking longer and I might start blaming that on saying, well, you know, this 10.16 beta is running slow and, you know, like, cause that would be my experience with it. And I don't know that I would ever have noticed this. And so it's just one of those things where it's like, man, if, if you want things not to work, I can tell you two ways guaranteed to do that. Okay. So number one is I found this at CES. There was at least there were more than one vendor where I'm like, yeah, show me your product. Show me what it does. And they're like, you know, this was working fine five minutes ago until you showed up. Yeah, it's, it's your <laughs> I'm like, fault. That's hey, right. hey, it's my job. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And the second thing, when I was in the corporate world, you know how you get a demo, like a, a product concept demo to fail? You get a C-suite guy to watch you do the demo. Right. Right. It's exactly. like, oh, CEO walks into the room and all of a sudden it's like everything burns. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So anyway, I, you know, I'm glad to have noticed this, but it as you know, I've been cogitating over it since then. It's like, man, how many other weird idiosyncratic setup, you know, setups that impact performance have I experienced over the years completely blissfully unaware or perhaps not so blissfully unaware, but you know, I never would have thought to question, well, you know, but hats drive. off to you that you documented, you reproduce the conditions that caused the, the, the failure oh, yeah. or, or lower speed. Yeah. Now I just need to test it with another drive, preferably from a different vendor. And maybe this pluggable one is the right one to test it with. I've, I've got a couple others that I can sort of mess with, but um I, I want to see what happens, like especially if this pluggable one is not capable of talking USB C, and I plug that in in that scenario, does it not connect? You know, which honestly would be preferable than to connecting slower. I mean, I realize that that's you know sort of a, a switch, but um, it does. Okay, so this pluggable one says compatible with Thunderbolt three host systems. USB C systems without Thunderbolt three are not supported. So, OK, so now I know what to test with. So I, I have my I have my marching orders. I will report back. Uh, I have. Another sponsor I want to talk about, John, and that is Cashfly's web content optimization engine. Now, we all know Cashfly as the. Uh, service that helps us get the show from us to you because they they have this worldwide truly worldwide network of computers that make up their content delivery network well cashfly does other things too they are interested in speed everything that they do is focused on making it easy for you to get your content to other people faster and more efficiently. And that's why when we publish Mac Geek Gab, we send it to Cashfly. They then publish it to their whatever it is, you know, several dozen computers, their points of presence all over the world. So if you happen to be in Australia, you're not downloading it 
uh, you're not downloading the show from Virginia like I might be here in New Hampshire. You're downloading it from a computer closer to you. And that's great. Well, their web optimization engine over there at Cashfly is built to do this kind of thing for your website. And it's so cool because they've got they know so much about all this that they can apply what they've learned to what you're doing with your website and actually have even some of the intelligence of your website living on the edges, right? Uh, with their web optimization. And that way it doesn't have to go back to your main server. It can all happen on the edges, image optimization, load balancing, smart asset delivery. It all can happen sort of out there closer to your users than it does here. And Cashfly are going to provide you a free optimization consultation just because you're a Mac Geek Gab listener. So go to mac.cashfly.com. That's M A C dot C A C H E F L Y dot com, or just go to macgeekgab.com and click the link in the show notes. Our thanks to Cashfly for sponsoring this episode and for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. So thanks, Cashfly. All right. Um, Darius had a question that I, I wish I, he had asked, asked us this question years ago because it's one that I'm happy now to have the answer to. He says, um, I'm looking for the best solution to extract email addresses from Apple Mail into an Excel or text file. He says, I have over 100,000 emails from customers who bought items from us with names, emails and address details. We'd like to extract email addresses to use in our MailChimp campaigns. Uh, i.e. if an area or city or country could be extracted, that could be great, too, because we could also do geographical mails to people. He says, I'm happy to use paid software like email extractor from maxprog.com, but ideally looking for a one step solution, i.e. drag a mail's inbox with our sales data and hit extract. Boom. Well, the good news is that Darius gave me a clue because I didn't really have one when he thought about this, uh, but he, he does. And it's email extractor from MaxProg. Um, it says that it will work with lots of different files to parse out email addresses. But one of them is EML files. And that's what mail for Mac OS stores all your messages in. So I did a quick test with their free download, which is the, the full engine, but it stops at 100 addresses. So once it's extracted 100 addresses, it's fine. Um, I threw a folder of mail at it. And boom, it just built a list, which it then would export as, you know, uh, carriage return separated or comma separated files. And you could pull into Excel, just like you said. I mean, it's it is a por very portable list and that would work perfectly for slurping into MailChimp. So uh, it's definitely worth checking out. And you can find your email um, files if you go into your home folder and go to library and you can get there just by going to the go menu, hold down in the finder. So in the finder, go to the go menu, hold down the option key and you will see the library folder appear. Go there, uh, then go into the mail folder. So home library mail for Catalina. All your mail is in, stored in a V7 folder. And then you're going to see a bunch of different uh, folders in here, one for each of the email accounts that you're logged into. So there might only be one or two and then a separate one for what we call your quote unquote on your Mac data as well. So depending on where you have all these messages that you want to look, you're just going to have to kind of twist these open. The folder, the top level folder names are all these, you know, UUID or serial number kind of things that probably won't mean anything to you. But once you twist them open, you will see the um, the names of your mailboxes and hopefully you can sort of suss out which is which. Uh, if you can't twist open the one that says inbox, twist open one of its subfolders. And, uh, you know, once you get down to an EMLX or an EML file, um, just go ahead and, and use quick look. Uh, hit the space bar on it and see what it is. And then you'll see, oh, this is this comes into that address. OK, great. Now I know what it is. And you can find your mailbox and, you know, throw it at email extractor and you're good to go. So super handy. I, I have no doubt that I will wind up using something like this. Don't worry. We will use our powers for good here at Mac Geek Hub like we always do. We never try to be evil uh, <laughs> with anything, especially when it involves. I, I say this because I know that everybody listening, th th you know, knows that we have 
many of you, we have your email addresses because you've, you've sent us email over the years. It's how we answer your questions. We've, we've managed that with trust so far. Uh, so we have no intention of stopping that, but so there you go, <laughs> but it would have been handy. Like for example, when, you know, when we had to switch feeds or whatever we did, there was a thing we did a, a number of years ago where it was like, we got to get in touch with all the listeners. And it's like, how do we do this? Ah, well, you know, as long as we don't blast them with spam, you know, on a, a daily basis, a once every few year email to everybody saying, Hey, it's us, you know, here you go. You've emailed us before. I wanted to let you know, here you go. Like, that's not such a bad thing. So, so there you go. All right. Thoughts on All that? All I one, got John? is, um, yeah. well, I'll, I'll toss out if, if you want to try to do this yourself. So I started fiddling while you were going on about how to do, um, emails and stuff. And, yeah. uh, it appears Dave that open office and more likely their offshoots seem to support something called an email mail merge. So if you want to roll up your sleeves and figure out how to do it yourself. Well, but how would they get, how would you get the email addresses for that? I mean, that's what we're asking. Well, you'd have right? to get them. Uh, yes. You, you would have to import them from something. At, and I think that's what, out. that's what Darius is looking for is how do you not, not what engine are you using to send them out? But no, how fine. are you extracting them from this, you know, slew of emails that you've received over the years? That's the question yeah. here is it just seems to me that there looks to be a feature in some of the office suites that may be smart enough to look at a file and pull out the email address for you. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Huh? All yeah. Right. No, it was just a tangent. I was yeah. thinking about it's like, well, if I was trying to do this. What would I do? At first I looked at pages and pages doesn't seem to have any sort of mail merge whatsoever, but then it's okay. free. So you get what you pay for. Sure. Sure. Uh, office, as far as I can tell, has some form of it, but, uh, but I think it's more physical mailing. Mm, but again, okay. open office seems to offer a email mail merge huh. feature. Cool. So, all right, cool. You know, just yeah. for kicks. Yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. All right. Um, there. The last time I had to do a mailing, and yeah, we actually have one coming up, I think. <laughs> but I like MailChimp. MailChimp oh, is, yeah. is very good at parsing uh, files and pulling out the, the good stuff. Yeah. 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 What, like you would use this email extractor thing to get the CSV together that you would then sort of pour into MailChimp and let it, you know, let it pull. But yeah. 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 Right. Whereas we, we got our boys in the back room working on that. Right. I would use this. Yeah, I mean, I don't need to. I don't need boys in the back room anymore. If I've got email extractor, it's all good. So, yeah. Uh, Charlie sent me a Facebook message, actually, uh, because he's a, a, a somehow cousin. I don't know. Anyway, Charlie says, um, I have a storage question. My current production computer is a 2010 Mac Pro. It's four internal drive bays have one 256 gig SSD with Mac OS on it, a two terabyte SATA drive with user documents, a one terabyte SATA drive with client files and a one terabyte SATA drive with more client files. And then in a PCI slot, a one terabyte NVMe drive. Uh, that's a work drive for sort of my in pro progress projects. He says, I've ordered a new Mac Pro. But I am stumbling on how to migrate all this storage from my old one to my new one. So what would you do? And, you know, that is the question that you are almost always asking us whether you know it or not. Right. Like, you know, as I approach any question that you folks write in, you know, where it's like, OK, you know, you've got this problem or, or a scenario and you want to know the solution. The, the answer almost always comes from the standpoint of. Well, if I were there, what would I do next? I mean, with, with Charlie's thing, it's more of a theoretical question, uh, but not really. I mean, it's a very, very practical question, but sometimes troubleshooting things. It's like, you know, you write in, you tell us I've tried X, Y and Z, you know, I, but it still hasn't worked. So it's like, OK, well, sometimes we know the answer, but a lot of times it's OK. Well, what would we do if we were there? You know, what would I do if I were sitting there with you? How would we attack this problem? So, um so Charlie was hit that right on the nose. And here's the thing. I'm thinking that for those SATA drives, maybe a Thunder Bay from Otherworld Computing would work. I mean, really, you're looking for an enclosure that will let you just put a bunch of disk disks in. And, and I use that phrase intentionally because there's a term called JBOD, J-B-O-D, just a bunch of disks. 
And that's what you want to do is put all these things into it, it, something that can like literally mount them and then also connect them software wise electronically to your new Mac. Cause you're not going to be putting them inside it most likely. Um, so the Thunder Bay is one of these boxes. There are others, but you know, I I'm assuming you with the, the, the nice part about these things is you then have a choice. Your Mac is what's managing this, right? So you could, although in your case, what you described, Charlie, you definitely not want to do this uh, unless you're changing your workflow dramatically, but you, you could raid these together or, you know, connect them as one volume in some way. But again, you'd be doing that from your Mac, either with Mac OS's built in raid stuff or because I'm recommending an OWC product, you could use their soft raid, right, to do this. But you in this case, you really wouldn't. You just want your Mac to see that there are what whatever four or five drives in there and you want to mount them each individually. So you put your four SATA drives in, uh, you mount them. And you're good to go. Again, you could use soft raid or even Mac OS's built in raid to stitch them together, but that's not your workflow. Um, as for the NV, so that's for your SATA drives, right? Is, is that uh, the something like a Thunder Bay? Those are, that's really the, the trick because it's just right there. Um, as for your um, NVMe drive, I think the Envoy Pro from also from Otherworld Computing, uh, Envoy Pro EX would be the answer that will hold your NVMe drive and also, uh, you know, connect it Thunderbolt three or USB C, depending on how you're going to do it. Oh, actually, I guess it is a USB C device, um, but it is, it does say Thunderbolt three compatible. I don't know. What are its speeds that will tell us whether it's actually going? Oh, it's, I mean, it says it'll do a thousand megabytes per second, which depending on what your drive is, might be plenty fast enough, or maybe you'll need to go with a faster enclosure. But um, an empty Envoy Pro EX is 70 bucks, 69, 68.99 right now uh, from, from there. So that's, uh, that's what you would, I think that's what you'd want to do. Uh, but there, you know, there are other NVMe enclosures too. So. If, if you need something faster, well, they're, they're out there. But yeah, you're just essentially moving the enclosure, physical enclosure for your drives from the inside of your computer to the outside. But these things aren't terribly expensive. Like a Thunder Bay is uh, 400 bucks, 390, 499 from OWC right now, a four bay, a Thunder Bay four. And, and that, you know, that's handy. You could find a, you know, sort of not name brand thing for less you get to choose whether you want to put your drives in that or not. For a lot of us, that might be okay for mission critical stuff. You might want somebody where, you know, you're getting support and all that stuff. So that's, you know, that's your call, but yeah. Thoughts on that, John. Looking at that machine, my only concern, Dave, is that the 2010 and so first hats off <laughs> that you have a 2010 machine. I well, thought I mean, that's, I was the, bad. that's the Mac pro, right? So that's right. The the only thing I'll mention is that looking at our favorite utility Mac tracker, that machine only has um, limited connectivity and that it only has SATA to oh, sure. SATA ports. So yeah. you're not getting the most you can out of, uh, I suspect, out of the drives that you have in there. Well, except I'm kind the, of surprised except for the NVMe one because he's got a PCI Correct. slot. Right. Right. And this machine has PCI. Uh, let me see, two 16-lane PCI Express and two four-lane PCI Express. So, yes, you could certainly get a PCIe card uh, to get better speeds. Um, I'm surprised that you didn't suggest perhaps a Synology, Dave. That That's actually, looking at the size of the drives, that would... Oh, no, no, no. You don't I think? Definitely not? not. Because, okay, because really? he's, he's currently using these drives as direct attached and addressing okay. each drive individually he's not looking for network storage he's he's looking for okay. a solution for his internal storage ascent or a direct you know i mean it, it's right. right so i mean you could but as soon as you do that like he can't just take his drives and put them in a synology and have it read his data it would require wiping these drives and sort of re right 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 architecting okay. this thing so no, that's, I get you. that's why I get you. this is more just like how do you how do you clone this workflow 
to this new machine right. and that's why okay so a nas would just kind of complicate things it, it would, it's a different solution think. versus a direct connect okay yeah, I get it's just that. a different solution that's all yeah. yeah yeah and then of course the other question would be well how about a drobo but i think you're feeling same like problem feeling about the future of well they have direct connect stuff though, yeah but, but but not in a j no but, but he, yes it's he would proprietary have okay Right. So that's why I'm thinking, yeah, no, it needs to be a J bot okay. good. for, for what it. he's doing. No, it, these are good questions because I bet people listening had similar questions. Like, why wouldn't you just Dave talks about Synology all the time? What? Why didn't he think of that? Or uh, no, it, like the J bot idea. It really is a cool concept, because if you think about it and then perhaps this is the best way to approach sort of learning about what a J bot is on these old machines like that Mac Pro you know, you could just put disks inside and truly you were putting just a bunch of disks inside your computer and then mounting them similar to what we do with just a bunch of separate like external USB-C or Thunderbolt disks. You're just plugging them in. The nice right. part about a thing like the Thunder Bay enclosure or like I said, an, even an off brand JBOD enclosure where you're just, you know, throwing these is each disk in there shows up to the computer as an individual disc, just like it would if you plugged it in individually slash separately. So, you, like I said, you can choose to raid them together, but you would be doing that in software. And there's actually a lot of uh, arguments for why software raid, especially with with more than two discs, is absolutely the right way to go uh, on a Mac OS machine. But um, I, I won't I won't distract why? us with that. But but that is a, a conversation uh. worth having. And we've had it on this show before, and we'll probably have it again. Right. But And right. I see, to yeah. add to the distraction, this machine actually does offer an optional Mac Pro RAID card. Remember that? <laughs> oh, the, the old Mac Pros did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this machine, I'm just looking at the at the, the things they offer, and that's one of the things. And I'm like, wow, that's really going back. Yeah. And that Apple actually offered a hardware solution to do, yeah. to do the RAID stuff. Yeah. But, um. Uh, and then John in the chat room is saying he found the OWC Express 4M2, which looks to be an enclosure for NVMe SSDs that is Thunderbolt 3. So that's the answer. If you if the Envoy Pro EX is not fast enough for whatever uh, you're using. You can use this and it's got four NVMe uh, SSD slots. So this is a JBOD for NVMe drives, not for SATA drives, which is an interesting thing. And it can do up to 2,800 megabytes per second. And, you know, you can have eight terabytes of storage in there. So, oh, nice. Fine. Thank you, John NCSU CPE in the chat room. You are a rock star. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. Express 4M2. Good, good, good. Yep. Awesome. Fun. You know what, Dave? Like all rock stars, I, I think we may have to step off the stage. Uh, it, you know, it, like there is a, a rule in performing, leave them <laughs> wanting more. And I, I think it's time to, uh, to, to bow to that. So there you go. Thanks for listening, folks. This has been... Uh, this has been a fun one. I hope you learned something. You know, I didn't. Uh, it's always interesting where we go in the shows and this last discussion about JBOD and especially with the questions you asked, John, to help kind of frame what it is and what it isn't yeah. is it's fantastic. Like it, there I, was a method to my madness. Yeah. No, this is <laughs> awesome. I, yeah, this is great. That's good. Stuff. Plus, Dave and I both saw that big hook coming from stage left. Mm. And uh, that that's usually a sign that we have to. Uh, that is, Shuffle along. That is where we exit. It is true. Yep. Uh, very nicely done. Uh, yeah. So thank you to our sponsors for this episode. Of course, LegalZoom.com and uh, Cashfly, Mac.Cashfly.com. I do want to thank, you know, we mentioned actually quite a few things that we saw at CES. And again, that wouldn't have been possible without our CES coverage sponsors, which were iMazing, Otherworld Computing, Text Expander, and Carbon Copy Cloner. We'll put a link to that in the show notes here too, of course. 
Thanks to all of you for listening. Thanks for your great questions. Thanks for helping us through all of this. It, um, these conversations don't work without it being interactive amongst all of us. And so all of the things that you do every week, folks, and posting in the forums and asking questions and sending them in via email and, you know, however you get them to us, it's great. Uh, I, I'm still thinking about ways of sort of compartmentalizing it all, but, but I, I think we've actually, we've got it in a good spot. There might be, there's always room for improvement, right? But uh, in terms of workflow efficiency, I really do like mm. when you folks ask questions in the Mac Geek Cab forums because it means that the the entire audience has the opportunity to see them and chime in with their thoughts before we first talk about it in the show. Most of the time, you know, if you send us an email, we read the email. Generally, one of us takes it and runs with it. Sometimes we consult with each other before the show. Certainly during the show, we consult. And then... All the, you know, smarts coming from you folks and the audience that can sort of help in the hive mind happens after we begin the discussion. But at the Mac Geek Cab forums, that happens potentially before we talk about it in the show. So uh, I really it, it's awesome. So go to MacGeekCab.com slash forums. Check them out and, and you can post there, but you can also participate in the discussion. They as I like to say, those forums are yours, not ours. Uh, we're there, of course, but. They are, you know, for you to interact with each other as much as they are there, perhaps even more than they are there for you to interact with us. Although, you know, like I said, that that happens there, too. So. All right. Uh, enough of our rambling here, John. I think that's uh, that the hook is all too close, my friend. So it's time to go. We will see you next week. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to uh all of our other sponsors, Barebones, Eero.com slash MGG, Lino.com slash MGG. It's been uh, good. Cool stuff found and answers. I mean, that's like the meat and potatoes of what we do here. I love it. Mm-hmm. Have a great week, everybody. We will be back, of course, next week, as, as is always the plan. And uh, do us a favor. Take your time with what you do this week. Be intentional about what you do. Take care of yourselves. I meant what I said during the legal Zoom spot and, and get those, you know, durable power of attorney and, and healthcare proxy and all that stuff in place. Trust me on that. And that's just, that's part of this overall message, right? Because what you want to make sure is that you don't get caught. Made up.